Hello to all our viewers and welcome back to one of Recruit My Mom's webinar series as we celebrate our 10th birthday. Today I have two friends that I respect enormously in their fields of expertise talking to me. The first is my friend Africa Mklope, author, speaker and consultant to corporates wanting to shift and improve their understanding of the impact of customs on company culture. And the second is Rowan Belchers, a leader practitioner who has been understanding the role of the system leader responsible for the total performance of the entire system. Rowan is the founder of Locktech, which serves as a global, serves a global client base made up mostly of CEOs who share a common desire to develop leadership craft. And um, over the years, I've come to know um, Rowan, who's been a great help to me and recruit my mom, and Africa, who I've come to know more recently, but have such an enormous respect for. So first of all, Africa, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you and Rowan. Thank you, Africa, and welcome, Rowan. Thank you, Philippa, and for all of the um, recruit my mom clients out there, I just want to add my voice to one of many around what a cool, wonderful, remarkable little business that is. So I'm happy to be here for that reason, amongst others. Well, thank you, Rowan. That's, that's really kind. You've always been such a great supporter of us and really do appreciate it. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how customs complicate company culture. Uh, these are customs that both companies and individuals might have. And I think it's important that we define what customs are. And customs are a traditional and widely accepted way of behaving or doing something that is specific to a place, a time, or a society. And at this time, in um, having come out of COVID, we've seen an enormous work shift. And company culture is something that a lot of people and companies are grappling with. And so today we want to unpack and discuss what the implication is of custom on company culture. So Rowan, my first question is to you is, could you define company culture for us? Because I think there's many definitions out there. There are, Phil, um, and it's a really broad and powerful topic and complex at times, but actually also probably it should be more simple than what it is. So my, um, I've heard two definitions for this. I can't claim ownership of either. The one is the way we do things around here, which is a nice, really, you know, palatable way of thinking about it. And the other, which I think is a little better, um, is what we do when nobody's looking. And uh, I think that is also helpful because it suggests that Culture isn't this thing that you show off. Culture is just how it is. And if it is being something that's shown off, then it's probably not an authentically projected culture. Probably, you know, it's, um, it's big on show. Um, but I, I think the thing about culture is it's actually in the micro movements, the micro decisions, the micro actions or non-actions that companies take when nobody's looking. That's really... Some people even say what it's like when the lights are turned off. That's another way of thinking about it. But it's, I like all of those definitions because they position culture as being something that's just really normal and everyday and not something that is crafted and written down and put on walls. That might be one part of culture, but often that masks a real culture. So I'm more interested in the real than the projected. Yeah, I think those are really good definitions. I particularly like the one that it's it's when nobody's looking what's happening. Um, and I think that that's very powerful, actually, in an organization. Africa, living in a diverse country like ours, with as many different people groups as we do, why is it important that companies understand individual culture and customs and the impact, if any, that it has on company culture? Well, just, just to add one thing on, on what Ron said, um, you know, when people are, dis when culture is, is displayed or showed off, I call this cultural exhibitionism. It's more real and authentic when people do that. It's, what's most impactful is what people don't show, but, but, is in, but is guiding their decision-making process. In other words, what they may not display publicly, but yet it displayed through their actions. So you don't really know what the culture person follows until you see how they act. 
And so that's where culture becomes powerful. It's, it's in the fact that it's of, of informing behavior. In other words, a company may have a certain set of goals that are very clear for everyone who works for it, but do not agree on the process of how to achieve those goals because of the issue of diversity of culture. So why is it matters for companies to know individual cultures? Because people are not, are not, are not robots, so you don't program them. You don't, when they come the gates of the company, they don't become empty vessels that are just filled with any information. They come preloaded with certain presuppositions, ideas, belief systems, even superstitions, even fatalism and worldview. And so that is a filter to which they are processing everything that's going on. So while you have goals for company, people might filter a certain um, announcement made in a, they may misunderstand a simple announcement because of their cultural paradigm. They may see something that is not what the company is, is intending to be, but misread it because the way it's communicated, which again is a medium of culture, the way it's communicated and by who and the mannerisms goes against a fundamental aspect of their culture. That's where the con con sometimes conflict arises. It's when there's misreading uh, and, and ways of how. So individual culture is very important therefore. For the company to be informed, who am I dealing with here? Where do they come from? How do they understand the world? And if, if I'm gonna speak to them, do they hear me the way I think I'm projecting myself or are they hearing me differently from the way I'm, I'm projecting myself? Yeah, and if I could add to that, Phil, one of the things, um... I've, I've worked with this is this idea of everyone's got a story that, that they tell themselves that like that maybe the official word is a narrative. So, so if a CEO says, we are growing and it's an exciting path ahead, and everyone should be excited, someone else might have a story of, I don't like growth, I don't like change, and I don't like speed. Um, so, you know, even though the, the intended message might be a it's heard through a, a filter that might actually lead to B action, not A action. And I, I, I think that's where, um, you know, cultural sensitivity just means acknowledging that people have their own existing stories about everything. And you've got to be aware of that uh, as a communicator inside all organizations, but particularly inside businesses where moves generally come fast and furious and change happens um, often without warning. Yeah, um, I can imagine. And, and I would imagine, um, Rowan, with your work that you do with CEOs, is that you've seen the impact that an, a CEO directly has on culture. And the question I have for you is, you know, how, do, how does the CEO's individual um, cultures and customs underpin the culture of the organization? And as that organization morphs and changes, you know, what is that impact long-term on that organization if those things stay and, you know, the CEO re endorses those things, if you like? Yeah, great question. Phil, there's a, um, there's a school of thought that says the following. Um, which is that the parts of culture that grow fastest and strongest are the parts that are in an organization's blind spot, meaning the things that they're not aware of, not cognizant of, don't give credence to. Those are the things that actually, you know, maybe I think the saying is cultures grow well in the dark or in the damp or something like that. And, and maybe, maybe that's a nice analogy here because when a culture grows, and I'll get to the CEO um, implications in a second, but when a culture grows, generally the things that are wanted, those are given the attention. We want, you know, flexibility, nimbleness, generosity, whatever the culture is. But it's oftentimes the stuff that companies don't look at, which is what grows. And I think that's an interesting um, angle because, you know, essentially what I work with or work on with CEOs is I work on three parts of them. I work on their character, I work on their skill, and I work on their knowledge. And this particular topic covers all three, but it primarily resides in character, which is why I, I, I really encourage CEOs to like, just do their own work, you know, do their own work, whether it's on diversity 
on cultural sensitivity, on communication skills, on language choice, whatever it is, if they haven't done their work, and when I mean work, I mean their personal development work, then it's in a blind spot. And when it's in a blind spot, it can grow. And it can grow out of control because you're not looking at it. So, so the safest thing, and I often challenge CEOs in my coaching sessions, I often put a question to them, are you safe to lead? And it's a really confronting question because most people don't like to be challenged on whether they are safe or not, myself included. But it's a good question because it calls into play the importance of doing your work. If you do your work, then any kind of failing can be forgiven because it's, it, you're failing authentically and you're failing with good intent. But when it's a blind spot, that means you just haven't taken the time or the effort to look at something that might be hard to look at. And so this is the link between CEO, blind spot, and what generally ends up building or growing in a, in a company culture. Yeah, I, and what's interesting is, is how often one hears that culture is then often designated to HR um, to manage and to look after. Um, when I, I, I think we should ask um, Africa why he's smiling. Wow. He, he and I both broke into a smile at exactly the same time. So what is that smile about, Africa? Yeah, because it's ridiculous to reduce this culture to an HR function when it actually permeates every sphere of the company. And it's, its main um, sort of spotlight or the, the, the light, the beam, the beam of the culture of the company will be the CEO, as, as you touched it, Ron, that people will look at him and how he performs, regardless of what rules are set by HR, but the actual exhibition or the actual behavior of the CEO sets the tone for the company. So if he himself is not adhering to the, to the sort of protocols that the company had sent, it doesn't matter. Somehow the, the bad parts of his behavior, his personality are more going to fester and, and take over the company's operation, whether he's aware of it or not. Yeah, it's very, very, it's almost impossible for something to have traction or take shape if it's not aligned with the CEO's agenda. Because the, the, the influence of a CEO, it doesn't matter if the business is five people, 500 people, or 5,000. The, yeah. the influence of the chief executive officer is so disproportionately large that, you know, that's both a blessing and a curse. Because with a great CEO, you get extreme, almost exponential influence. But with a poor CEO with blind spots who hasn't done his or her work, whew, that is a tricky situation, man. Yeah, that's why they pay they pay them quite substantially. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you see the demise of companies because of bad CEOship, right? But Africa, just get back to you on this. Um, yeah. Can you, because you've worked with companies and their employees, particularly in in better understanding their own customs and cultures and how that's impacting either on their own career growth or yeah. um, you know, how it's impacting on the business as, at large. Could you just yeah. give us some stories, some examples of how an employee's culture can impact on their own personal growth journey and positive, be that positively or negatively and on company culture? Yeah. Right. Just before we do that, uh, answer the question, Philip, I just want to touch something back on, on, diverse, on diversity and uh, whether it's a strength or a weakness. Because sometimes in South Africa, we hear this, this refrain that diversity is a strength and we should celebrate diversity. I, I'm for that, but in practice, the African continent is the most diverse place on earth. There are over 3,000 different tribes, speaking over 5,000 different dialects. In practice, diversity becomes a weakness if it's mishandled. And that's what we see in Africa. Um, I think it's former, uh, former Mozambican president, Samora Michel, said for a nation to live, the tribe must die. And what he meant is that ethnocentricity and, and, and patriotism do not coexist very well. If you want to promote some level of uniformity for a shared goal, a shared vision, there needs to be some give or takes. There must be some compromise. Otherwise, there's just no way. So if we talk about cultural diversity, it's very important to mention that we don't mean that there must be a equal scale or shared equality 
of your individual culture plays a, a, against the company culture and they should all work, work parallel. The, the, the company culture has to have preeminence over each individual culture. Otherwise, there's no reason for us to call it a company. We may call it a group of individuals who are there for their own personal pursuits. If it's a company, then it's a cooperative, it's, it's, it's a collective, and it has a collective vision that brings us in together to achieve an agenda. And our individual vision is fulfilled in the fulfillment of the corporate vision. And as I, I prosper when the company prospers, not the other way around. So I have to subordinate my interests, the interests of the company, if I believe in its objective and what it's, it's following. And so now we're, we're in, in, in employees um, might sabotage sometimes, or even be in a place of advantage as far as the individual cultures are concerned. And in areas, and I'll make a few examples. Now, Western cultural system is individual based and the individual defines society. African cultural society defines the individual. So they come from two different ends. So one is individualistic, one is collectivist. And so collectivist cultures are good in looking for the interests of the collective, being communal. And so they are good in looking at the interests of the social environment that we all are happy and are doing well, not just the sum of parts or individuals. The problem with those cultures is that they tend not to be very good in, a, in encouraging an environment of individual accountability, of allowing people to be entrepreneurial and to be industrious and to have some sense of ambition in terms of career advancement. They tend to hold people back because people are looking at the views of the collective they don't want to rise above that. Whereas it's easier for Western culture to promote that environment by virtue of its orientation. So disadvantages therefore I've seen with African cultural system is that and, and tendencies as well to lean towards fatalism. Um, whereas the Western culture leans towards individual efforts, nothing ventured, nothing gained. The disadvantages of that is that they can promote a lot of individualism and selfishness that's why today we go back and, and revisit company operations and we look and think that the world needs better management systems in terms of companies incorporating the sphere of where they operate in terms of the environment and not just put profits before everything. And, and that's why extractive industries have been guilty in this area of pillaging um, and the environment and polluting environments and, 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 and leaving degradation behind them. So now we look back and think, well, profits have been made, but the world is made worse as a result of it. How do we now uh, continue to prosper as companies without destroying the environment? So people now, profits and planet are brought together in a kind of a system that said, look, we have to work with all, all three and in a sustainable way, right? So just uh, so, 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 so recap, so, in, so positive aspect of African culture is collectivism. Um, it has positive elements, um, it, you know, but it has negative elements that like it, it, it just it just cuts off individual accountability and, and um, people to perform at their best at their, at, their, at, their, at their peak is to have some drive personally. Western cultural system, it's good for that reason. It's good to encourage goal setting um, and having a vision to, to, to run after, but it's bad in terms of uh, the collective management of the world. For the betterment of tomorrow you know so those are a few things your thoughts yeah very interesting um and very insightful Rowan, i don't know if you have any comments on on what africa's um, yeah um i do but i don't want to take up too much time because i know you've got a list of questions in front of you but mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll just say this uh, my my marker for diversity is when it leads to richness and I don't mean richness in terms of wealth, although it can. Um, I mean, when, when the differences of opinion, differences of backgrounds, differences of cultural views, when it all comes together to elevate, that, that equals richness for me. Sometimes those can come together to hold a company back. It can lead to divisiveness. It can lead to all kinds of things. So my marker for, for diversity is that it must ultimately foster richness for everybody and encourage multiplicity of views and opinions and insights and those sorts of things so so that's how i think diversity has become a bit of a you know it's like sustainability it's quite a heavy word now um so i i try to put some humanity in it and for me diversity basically when done well equals richness mm. yeah i agree so 
You often hear that the easiest organizations to manage or run or to hold together are homogenous organizations. And you can understand that you've got groupthink, you don't have the, the level of diversity that we're talking about today. Yet the, the kind of focus words that one's hearing at the moment in organizations is diversity, belonging and inclusion. So a question to both of you, um, and you can decide who wants to take it first, is if we truly want to create healthy, strong, diverse organizations in a country like ours, which is as diverse as ours, you know, where do you begin um, if you've already inherited, you know, possibly some companies, you know, somebody listening to this has inherited a culture in their organization, possibly they're starting out as a startup, but, you know, where does one begin with all of this? Hmm. Africa, would you like to take that or do you want me to go? Okay. Sorry, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, one of the most um, comforting truisms around business and culture is that humans, because of their brains, our brains, we are entirely elastic. We can change anything about ourselves at any time. And that means that it's all on the table. Now, that's not to say it's easy, but it's to say it's possible. No culture is set. And so maybe I'll answer this from, from the, the point of view of the CEO. A culture is malleable. If a culture isn't what you want it to be, it can change very, very quickly with some skill around culture building, right? It does require skill and it does require character and it does require knowledge. Um, those three sort of basic tenets of leadership. But cultures are, are malleable and, and they should be malleable and flexible because the world is changing so quickly. The business world is changing so quickly. And while it is good to have um, some consistency of culture, it doesn't mean that consistency is beyond being refined. Refinement should be on the table. So I have a client that I work with there, uh, mostly a white Afrikaans business, who are wanting to open up a, um, a market segment in a culture that they are not familiar with. Um, and my point to them was, don't try to go in there until you've done your work know what you're talking about, know the dynamics, expose yourself, stretch yourself, make yourself uncomfortable, and then go in with all of the cultural learnings that you will have accumulated along the way. But the basic point I'm making here, Phil, is that if a culture isn't fit for purpose, it's a very easy, quick thing to change if it's well led. Yeah. The, the, other, the other thing, Philip, is that, um, there's emotional attachment that people have towards culture and uh, it's emotions that actually are the strings that pull decisions that people make. In other words, if people's emotions are moving in a certain way, they are likely to act in, in line with the direction that the emotions are pulling towards. So culture it has a power to pull people's emotions. That's why when people's cultures are disrespected, they feel certain ways and therefore are likely to act in a certain way. When their cultures are affirmed, they're also the opposite happens. So, so I understand the logic that it's easy to manage homogeneous groups is because there's already a shared cultural system and very therefore limited possibilities of rubbing each other the wrong way because we somehow sort of understand what we mean. We somehow understand the reference point, the examples we make, and the drinks we drink. So there's a similarity, there's a shared value system there that it doesn't need to be worked on. It's already you know, inherent from our upbringing, you know? And so diversity then creates a necessity to learn. And maybe that's why people are maybe lazy to do is that diversity requires me to step out of my comfort zone a bit, to learn how other people understand the thing I'm presenting to them. How are they hearing it? And so that's where perhaps it's, it stretches a little bit of, of, of company managers and directors to say, look, um, it would have been easy had we been homogeneous that we would just come at this certain time and just get this thing so over and done with. But it's not that case. Now, is that a strength or is that a weakness? Now, I was chatting recently to a company as well, and, 
and they presented this problem of, of being just monolithic cultural system because they're all Africaners and they were looking at how do they diversify. One thing I said to them is that don't just pick up a, a person of color and just incorporate the, the company for sake of diversity because it's going to be a bad marriage. Um, you know, you, first of all, build a relationship, understand that. I said skills is one thing. You obviously need a person with skills, they're doing anyone a favor. They must have qualified, they must have skills that will add to the company. But beyond that, they're a person that you're bringing, especially if they're talking about person at the executive level, the director level, not just an employee. So now you're bringing not only a accountant or a lawyer, you're bringing an individual with a preset of, of beliefs and, and, and worldview, which you need to be familiar with, not to try and change it, but at least to try and understand it so you can engage it properly. Okay, this guy has this set of presuppositions that I can engage in, but if I'm making a joke with him, these are the kind of things I must not say. These are no-go areas. Because the last thing I want to do is to think this thing is funny and it's actually not funny. And I, and I offend a person. I don't intend to, because I didn't understand his presuppositions, but he values these things differently than the way I value. I think it's a trivial issue. I can just make a joke about it. And he thinks it's a fundamental um, and inherent issue of his culture. So, so some basic understanding, I mean, some of us who travel overseas, we would, would attest to this, how greeting in Asia is different from greeting in Africa. You know, you don't, people don't shake hands. You know, often, instance, you stretch out your hand and they bow before you, so there's a bit of a conflict of minutes right there. And, uh, and, and so how people I view talking, who talks first? Eye contact, is it disrespectful? Is it dishonest? You know, when you make eye contact, are you, you know, are you dishonest? Are you, you know? So there are all kinds of, of, of gestures and, and, and readings that may, we may have or might have. So I agree with that sentiment, although I don't think it will work anyway in South Africa. I mean, I did encourage this comment directors, look, it's for your interest. Because the market of South Africa is not monolithic, you're not going to sell to one group. It makes no sense, therefore, to have one group of people leading you because you're missing out eyes and ears and sensitivity, understanding, and you're missing out. You, you, the more people you have of diversity, the more spies, so quote unquote, of that group within the company to hear for you and see for you in that group's thinking so you can sell more products to that group of people. Mm. Like so that. can I add something there? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Sorry, I, I feel like Africa and I are sufficiently opinionated enough that we're hijacking your interview. So just stop us when you need to. That's fine. But, um, Phil, culture for me oftentimes is put in the box and, and these words won't be consciously used, but let's put a set of rules in place to keep everything okay. You know, that, that maybe that's the narrative. I'm a huge lover of the concept of performance because performance for me, by and large, if done right, just leads to excellence. It's a really good sort of gauge. I would love companies to be more self-serving around their cultures because, you know, going back to the monolithic company, that is such a business risk. You can't go into certain markets that you might want to. You don't have access to perspectives that might be really helpful you're actually hurting yourself. So for me, I, I encourage people to say, make your culture work for you. You know, make it fit for purpose, make it strategically aligned, make it nimble, make it alive and vibrant. Then it's actually an asset in your business as opposed to, you know, let's just keep everyone a little bit still and okay. That for me, it, that's doing a disservice to culture. It needs to be way more vital and way more dynamic than that. So I thought that might be an interesting mm, angle. I like that. So from what I'm hearing from the two of you, I'm hearing lots of words like dynamic. I'm hearing dialogue. Um, you know, it, this is something that, that, that is, it moves. You know, it's, it's not, as you said, Ron, it's not something you can keep under, you know, keep it at peace, if you like. It's, it's something that is going to require interaction. It's going to require active working, which is why you both smiled when I said, should culture be an HR activity? Because it's not just something that you tick a box on. It's actually something that is alive. And I, I would be amiss to bring into this conversation then why it is so important that we have um, a gender diversity 
in our organizations when 50% um, of our population is female and many of the decision makers in homes are women. Um, and so when one's creating products and services that ultimately the women are gonna be the decision makers on one, one neglects them at your own peril, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, Africa, um, just, you know, what advice would you give an HR manager or a senior executive um, on how to begin to understand the impact of individual custom and culture that might be impacting their com company culture now in the future? And Rowan, you're welcome to jump in off, you know, as well on this, but, you know, practically you've got um, entrepreneurs starting out businesses, you've got companies that have inherited cultures, like where would you begin and how do you start this? Yeah, one of the areas that, that becomes very apparent is, is when there is a conflict. Uh, often uh, often when, when a conflict is a, is a great revealer of, and of underlying issues that sometimes remain and, and the, you know, there but are not revealed. Because part of the issues that how people resolve conflict or misunderstanding reveals a lot about who they are. So sometimes people think that, um, they, sometimes people don't understand the value of conflict. Um, conflict has a value. It's like pain. Pain has a value. It just reveals that something is bad in the part of the body. And sometimes we'll use painkillers to mask the pain rather than to deal with underlying issue that the pain is revealing. So, so often, therefore, when there's a conflict, how people handle the conflict says a lot about who they are in terms of the company. So to be proactive, companies should rather engage things and engage people and create an environment that allows people to, be exp to express themselves freely in a way that helps us to minimize conflict. Because conflict sometimes happens because people have been keeping stuff inside of them and they have not an outlet. They have not felt the environment is, is encouraging for them to express themselves. And they have therefore easily miss things that they would have easily understood had there been an environment that was conducive. So in my view, the lunch of the company, when the company is growing, I only have numbers in my head. It needs to have a person who champions just the area of cultural diversity. Um, you know, whether they want to call it in the HR person, there needs to be a person whose role is to understand the tapestry of the company, its complexities, and what, how does a certain rule of the company impact its women? And how does a certain rule of the company impact these kinds of groupings or demographic people? And how do we become sensitive to how one rule impacts different people in different ways. For instance, you, 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 both of you are in the Western Cape. And one of the things I've learned about Cape Town particularly is that workplace and arrangement in terms of transportation, how it impacts somebody from Kaya Nature is massively big than how it can impact some other parts of, of Western Cape. And that has an impact on family life because people take so many hours to get to work and so many hours to get back to work that impacts family life, the time they spend with their children, Therefore, that impacts their sense of happiness and, and well-being, and which means it impacts their productivity. You know? So now they've realized the wellness of employees impacts profitability. So when employees are well within their personal space, their soul, their mind, and they're happy, they are more productive and the company becomes more profitable. But when people are used as like a part of machinery, they're simply used to clock in and clock out and achieve company objectives, they drag themselves to work, they do what needs to be done, but as soon as they get an opportunity to leave the company, they jump out. That's why there's so much turnover of employees. So as soon as they get an opportunity to leave, they jump out, whereas where companies take care of the employees, these are people who become loyal regardless of the pay. You know, sometimes companies think that the more increase the pay, the more it keeps employees uh, in that. But if the company is a toxic culture, people leave the company even though they're paid very well. Yeah. Phil, there's this, there's this Chinese proverb, again, another saying I can take no credit for, um, particularly because I don't speak Mandarin. Um, but um, the, uh, the saying goes, be gentle with people for they wage great battles. And you never know what battles are being waged, which completely impacts discretionary effort, which is the holy grail of all leaders, right? competing for the discretionary effort of your people. Um, you've got no way of knowing what those battles are unless you break bread with people. 
And fortunately, breaking bread with people and being in conversation with one another is wired into us over thousands of years. It's something that we are innately able to do if we value culture and if we value the attention and energy we put into culture, to Africa's point, having someone there dedicated to understanding the tapestry. But if the tapestry is not known because bread hasn't been broken, then those people continue waging those great battles in the dark. And that's, that, that's when you're losing discretionary effort, that's where turnover comes in, that's where conflict comes in, all of which has a price or a value, as Africa said. So, you know, culture can be this technical thing, but let's also remember that it's the most innately humane thing that we know, which is how to be with people in community. So, so this is one part of business where it's too rigid and too, um, it's just too mechanical. Culture should not be mechanical. It's not about putting five values on the wall that generally say integrity, honesty, communication, respect, and you know, those are all noble, but they add up to nothing if they're on the wall. For me, just looking at culture through a more human lens, which is getting to know people, breaking bread with people, understanding people, that's how to build a culture because then you know what you're working with. If you don't, the battles are waged in the dark. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when companies get it right, and, and I'd like to, um, I'd like you to think about um, companies in South Africa, because I think we have one of the most diverse countries around. I mean, I know we can talk about first world countries and their diversity, but I think South Africa is pretty unique in the level of diversity that we have. Can you draw on stories of companies that, and you don't have to name names, but you know how they get it right, what they're getting right, and some of the advice that you can give the people watching this webinar today as to these are the golden nuggets that you need to pull out in terms of this is how you do understanding people's individual customs and cultures and the impact that it has on company culture and how you do company culture well. I'll, I'll go after you, Africa. Me, um, Philip, is when, is when the company um, puts people at the center of the operation, that is their employees. I don't mean that in some kind of you know, um, superficial way where the CEO would say, my people are, are, my, are my greatest asset, you know. But I mean that a person really, really believes that um, the employees or the people, the staff and people work for the company are really worthwhile and they're very available people. And so they, derive, so they design um, activities and strategies and things in the company and put resources in them that makes them understand better how to engage people. And, and people are motivated. That is, we are we reach a level of getting people to some level of self motivation, and we understand what demotivates them, what makes them less productive. Understand the dynamics that happens in their lives prior to them enter the company gates. Understand better what goes on in their families. One of the companies in PE had asked me to come and do this, and and because they were seeing high turnover of employees, and they had the problems with company um, employee discipline and. Um, people showing up drunk or, or even giving false medical certificates and other disciplinary issues. And they were firing people and they said they don't want to do this. They want to be proactive. They don't want to keep having people dismissed. And what else can we do proactively? So I designed a program and so we sat with the employees and, and I realized and they discovered that as themselves that many guys, people are, are having personal, interpersonal conflicts and things at home. And another company is necessarily a problem. Uh, created by the company itself, but are impacting on them at work. That they, you know, and and there be a number of issues. So we we designed a program that sort of helps employees to be well, well equipped to deal with interpersonal issues, and we had to make it confidential. So whatever they share doesn't the company is not aware of it. So I sit as an outsider and deal with employees one on one and help them process different things. Some, some of them are deeply in the, uh, in, 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 into debt, so they don't see the, where their money goes. They don't manage their finances well. This is a personal issue. So I know the company, some of them have health challenges, some of them have uh, relationship issues are breaking down, children who are disobedient and rebellious, and alcohol, um, substance abuse, 
And, and then they come there to work and they're simply just there. And, and, I, and I talk to employees who say to me, I'm here just until four o'clock. And, I, and I, so they're just there to clock in and, and they, when they work, they're just looking at the clock. As soon as the clock hits four o'clock, they're out of the gate. They have no enjoyment. And they admitted that. And so, so therefore the company has to be aware that people would apply for the job because South Africa is a desperate job market. People need jobs. It doesn't mean they like the job. So many will keep the job because it puts food on the table. But the company has to move people beyond getting the job for the sake of it and help them to enjoy what they're doing. That will be to me a better place to arrive. I like that. I think that there is a, a sense of responsibility in terms of understanding where people's personal lives are at in terms of how it's impacting work. Um, so yeah, thanks Africa. Rowan? Um, Phil, there is a, a culinary school that I know of. I'm just trying to think of some stories rather than academic um, discussions. Um, and um, the, one of the values that this this culinary school has for shit that they train chefs is don't be disgusting. And it says everything, right? It says everything about one aspect of behavior in this culinary school that they think is important, which is cleanliness and hygiene. But what they did was they chose language that is so relatable, so clear, so evident what they mean that it just sticks, right? And this one really stuck. So if, if you're looking for best practices, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd give you three steers. One, when it comes to culture, know what you stand for and really stand for it. Don't be tactical about it. Don't be strategic. That just makes it skin deep. So know what matters to you and really stand for what matters. The second is to use palatable language like that. Uh, don't be disgusting. And the third is, it doesn't matter what you say about culture. If your walk doesn't back up your talk, it will fall over immediately. So there's an authenticity. In fact, it's not authenticity. It's, some, it's congruence. If, you're going to, if you want a culture that really is an asset to a business, which I think is the ultimate goal of all businesses, then stand for it. And don't think that you're going to be able to maneuver your way into a culture that works for you without actually living it, owning it, breathing it, talking about it, and particularly talking about it in the ways where culture has failed. That's when a culture becomes real. We didn't do that well. We fell over on that. We had a blind spot on this. That is when a culture actually feels real. And if a culture doesn't feel real, it is stone dead in the water. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just given the context of our discussion today is just to, if I can add to the wisdom that you've both shared, is, is to really unpack and understand um, the individual's personal cultures, beliefs, and um, yeah, just that they're bringing into the organizations. And, and how does that impact on the broader culture of the organization? So um, African Roan, we've come to the end of our discussion and I found it um, incredibly fascinating. And as always, I just enjoy the, your, both of your company. I always find it so wonderful to, to speak to you both. If people wanna get hold of you, um, we will in the in the chat and, and next to the webinar, we'll have your contact details, but won't you just um, just give out some of you, either your handles or how people could contact you, websites, anything. Rowan, would you like to start and then I'll pass to Africa. Sure. Um, my uh, company website, Lockstep, is lockstep.consulting and you can get me at rowan at lockstep.consulting. And I think, you know, if, if anyone did want to reach out to me, the thing that I'm most interested in right now is this idea of a business that matters. Mm -hmm. And so that wraps a whole lot of things in there, culture, strategy, talent, engagement. But that's the thing that I would really be most interested in working with people on is if, if you have the listener, this idea or this desire to make your business really matter that's, that's very alive for me and my business at the moment. And um, so maybe that's a little bit more of a fine, a finer invitation than do you want to reach out and chat? Yeah, thanks, Rowan. I appreciate that. Africa? Well, my contact details, um, 
It's info at africam.co.za. As long as you take into cognizance that Africa is with a K, not a C. So I, I am I'm not an English Africa. I'm a Fossa Africa. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's my that's my email address. My website is the same thing. It's, it's www.africam.co.za. Available in all the social media platforms. Um, if a person doesn't want to send an email, which is obviously the best thing to do for professional communication. Yeah, that's me. Great. Rowan, Africa, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, as I said, and I really wish all your endeavors, your books, um, Africa, we didn't even talk about your books, everything that you've written. Rowan, you know, with lockstep, every success. I really do appreciate both of you in my life. And um, it's been good to spend time with you today. Thank you.